The Lebanese government reported on Tuesday a total of 55 people killed and 156 wounded on the first day of the Israeli ground offensive in Lebanon. In Argentina, students, teachers and unions called for the second federal university march of the year for this Wednesday, October 2nd. And several affluents of the Amazon River are in a critical situation of water shortage due to the historic drought affecting Brazil. Hello, welcome from the south. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from the Resource Studios in Havana, Cuba. We'll begin with the news. The Lebanese government reported on Tuesday a total of 55 people killed and 156 wounded on the first day of the Israeli ground offensive in Lebanon and in the shelling by Israeli forces in the neighboring country. A majority of death, 22, occurred in Nabatea, in the south of the country, where 47 people were also injured, although the Ministry of Health did not specify whether they were killed by the ground offensive that Israel began on October 30th on the border. There were also three dead and 33 wounded in the province of Mount Lebanon, surrounding Beirut, and 11 dead and 19 injured in the province of Baalbek Hermal in the northeast. The Lebanese resistance movement Hezbollah inflicted heavy losses on Israeli troops attempting to infiltrate the south into southern Lebanon. The armed group reported that during the early hours of Wednesday morning, Dampush and Israeli infantry force attempted to advance towards the town of Odaisi, causing casualties and forcing the invading army to withdraw. Israeli media reported that four Israeli soldiers were killed and 20 others were wounded in what they called a serious security incident. These are the first clashes on the ground since the Israeli army announced Monday night that it was launching an operation into southern Lebanon. Following on the escalation of tensions on the Middle East on Tuesday, Israel launched new airstrikes on densely populated areas in the south of Beirut. The latest bombing caused the massive destruction of residential buildings and infrastructure in the, neighboring, in the neighborhood of Shia in the southern region of the Lebanese capital with no casualties being reported so far. According to the Lebanese Health Ministry, more than a thousand people have been killed in Israeli attacks since September 17th, almost a quarter of them women and children, while hundreds of thousands of people have fled their homes and are sleeping on beaches and streets. And Palestinian authorities denounced that in the last 24 hours, Israeli forces committed five massacres, leaving 51 deaths and 165 wounded in the Gaza Strip. Medical sources reported over 40 deaths in Han Yunis, including 12 family members, after Israeli troops conducted an hours-long ground incursion backed by artillery fire. Attacks were further registered in the north and center of the devastated Palestinian enclaves, so the number of casualties could be higher. Meanwhile, Israeli occupying forces said on Wednesday that they have dropped bombs on a third school in the Gaza Strip, allegedly used by the Palestinian resistance movement Hamas, after two other schools were hit past night by Israeli aircraft. The chief of staff of the armed forces of Iran, Mohammed Bagheri, warned that the Persian country will attack with greater force all Israeli infrastructure if the Tel Aviv regime bombs Iranian territory. The Revolutionary Guard and Iran's armed forces are ready both defensively and offensively to repeat this operation with multiplied intensity. If the Zionist regime, which has gone insane, is not contained by America and Europe and intends to continue such crimes or do anything against our sovereignty or territorial integrity, tonight's operation will be repeated with much higher magnitude and we will hit all their infrastructures. The Russian Foreign Ministry said Moscow is extremely concerned by the latest escalation in the Middle East and accused the United States of bearing a significant share of responsibility for the degrada degradation of the situation. I would like to underline again that Moscow is extremely concerned about a new dangerous round of escalation in the Middle East. We have repeatedly warned that the failure to resolve a number of crises in this part of the world 
primarily the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, is fraught with a large-scale aggravation of the situation. We believe that the United States of America bears a significant share of responsibility, not only in the historical context as a whole, but the United States also and especially bears responsibility for the degradation in the current situation. In other news, former Netherlands Prime Minister Mark Rutte was formally sworn in as NATO Secretary General replacing Jens Stoltenberg at a ceremony this October 1st. Rutte announced that support for Ukraine would be prioritized as he took over as head of the NATO military alliance at a ceremony in Brussels. He said the alliance must intensify its support for Ukraine and bring it even closer to NATO, after leaders of the defense pact said the country's path to membership was irreversible. Likewise, Reuters stated that the organization needs to fill its capability gaps and said that NATO is now bigger, stronger and more united than ever. He also expressed its intention to invest in NATO's essential partner, the European Union, and in countries around the world. Let's now take a short break, but remember you can join us on TikTok at Teles English, where you'll find news in different formats, news updates and much more. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back. In Argentina, a demonstration is called for this October 2nd in rejection of the lack of funding for public education carried out by Javier Milei's government. The divestment of education policies fostered by the government of Javier Milei generated a strong response at the university level. Students, teachers and unions called for the second federal university march of the year for this Wednesday, October 2nd. The central call will be in front of the National Congress. There will be mobilizations all over the country. Thousands of people are expected to join in defense of educational rights and university autonomy. The slogans include the rejection of budget cuts, privatization of services, and the elimination of scholarship programs. And Uruguay is preparing for the first round of elections, which will take place on October 27th, while the electoral campaign is gaining intensity. During the electoral campaign, the different political parties hold meetings with their militants to transmit the programmatic proposals that they will execute during their administration. In this sense, their favorite candidates are Yamandu Orsi for the Frente Amplio and Álvaro Delgado for the right-wing National Party. Yamandu Orsi leads the polls with an average of about 44% of voting intention, followed by Álvaro Delgado several points behind. Because I still think that it is worth doing politics and it is very valuable to do it in this wonderful place called Frente Amplio. I was telling Carolina that there are four weeks left, 28 days today, where people are going to enter a secret room. They are going to choose. They are going to vote. And when they vote, people solve their problems. And the most important thing is that they are deciding there, in a mandatory vote, the destiny of our country. We can do a lot, so that what is resolved on that day is the most correct, the most adequate for the Uruguayan people, and a sign of hope. In Guatemala, authorities dismantled a criminal network on October 1st with police among its ranks, responsible for smuggling migrants to the United States. According to Interior Minister Francisco Jimenez, 36 people, including 23 active and two retired police officers, were arrested in the operation that involved 34 raids in the capital and other cities. Jimenez stated that the ring used police officers by bribing them to guarantee the passage of people. Likewise, it also resulted in the seizing of illicit funds, electronic devices, and firearms. Jimenez noted this operation was part of a strategy by President Bernardo Arevalo's government not to criminalize migrants but to pursue and dismantle human trafficking structures. Again, the smuggled migrants from the municipality of Esquipulas using private cars and then used warehouses in Guatemala and Retalulio and then used Pullman-type vehicles to transport the migrants to Ayutla, 
where other members of the structure received them in warehouses and then transported them to Mexico. It is estimated that approximately 10,000 migrants moved through the network, with hundreds of migrants of different nationalities documented. And a historic day took place in Mexico as Claudia Sheinbaum was sworn in as the nation's first female president. During her first mentions as president, she pledged, among other things, to present on October 3rd a package of constitutional reforms aimed at strengthening women's rights. Our colleague Antonia Aranda prepared the following report. For millions of Mexicans, it was a day of celebration. Claudia Sheinbaum took office as Mexico's first female president in 200 years of independent republic. In our government, we will guarantee all kinds of freedom. Freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, freedom of movement. Freedom is a democratic principle and we're Democrats. Human rights will be respected and we will never use the force of the state to repress the people. Anyone who says there will be authoritarianism is lying. In the vicinity of the Chamber of Deputies, supporters of the new president showed their support hours before she arrived at the premises. Shall there be continuity with the second floor of the transformation? Andres laid the foundations. Today, it is Claudia's turn to build the second floor. The main thing is social justice. Just in those two words, social justice. Después de recibir la banda presidencial, After receiving the presidential sash, Claudia Sheinbaum went to the National Palace to receive the baton from 70 native peoples of Mexico. At the Plaza de la Constitución, in front of thousands of people, Claudia Sheinbaum listed 100 points of commitment that will guide her administration. Me comprometo con ustedes que entregaré mi conocimiento. I pledge with you that I will give my knowledge, my soul, my life, and the best of myself for the welfare of the people of Mexico. I pledge with you to always defend Mexico. I commit myself to exalt love, truth, honesty, and fraternity and to condemn any form of discrimination. This day, as her first act of government, Claudia Sheinbaum will visit the tourist port of Acapulco to supervise the support works for the victims of Hurricane John. Claudia Sheinbaum concluded her first day of activities as president of Mexico by offering a political message from the Plaza de la Constitución in which she reiterated the 100 points of government that she will develop over the next six years to build the second floor of the fourth transformation. Antonio Aranda, Telesur, Ciudad de México. We now have a second short break coming up, but before we invite you to visit our YouTube channel at Telesur English, there you'll be able to re-watch our interviews, top stories, special broadcastings, and more. Hit the subscribe button and activate the notification bell to stay up to date on the world's most recent events. Final break, don't go away. Welcome back. At least 45 people died and dozens are missing after two boats carrying refugees and migrants from Africa sank off the coast of Djibouti. According to the International Organization for Migration, the boats left Yemen with 310 people on board before sinking in the Red Sea. In response to this situation, the organization is supporting state emergency services in search and rescue operations. Moreover, the Coast Guard of Djibouti informed that a joint rescue effort has been underway since early on September 30th, with 115 survivors now rescued and dozens still missing. The Coast Guard also noted that the boat sank just 150 meters from a beach near the Khor Anga region in northwestern Djibouti. Several affluents of the Amazon River are in a critical situation of water shortage due to the historic drought affecting Brazil. 
Authorities report that the Iridi and Shungu rivers, which feed the Belo Monte hydroelectric plant, are below minimum levels for this time of year. Belo Monte generates 11% of the energy of the National Integrated System and records natural flows considerably lower than those raised during 2023 and close to the historical minimum. As a consequence, local indigenous communities report, resort to using ice, carrying it as they walk on the sand of the dried up Rio Negro. Reports indicate the possibility of reaching even more critical levels in October and November. I was born and raised in this community. We've rarely seen the river like this. Every seven or eight years it would dry up. But today we're seeing this drought come back to back. Last year the whole river dried up, and this year the whole river dried up again. Everybody's biggest problem today is electricity, which we don't have. And because we don't have electricity, we have to walk a kilometer to bring the ice. And on Wednesday, Chinese authorities ordered the closure of schools and financial markets ahead of Typhoon Kraton. Weather authorities forecast strong winds and heavy rainfall. 22 counties and regions of the Chinese island of Taiwan suspend the school and administrative activities as a result of the storm's advance. Authorities also cancel all domestic flights and dozens of international flights. In the city of Taitung, at least 23 people were injured, one of them seriously, while 2,735 people were evacuated. Since Wednesday morning, the typhoon has been weakened into a moderate typhoon. And the government of Nepal reported that the rains that hit the country last weekend caused losses of $127 million in addition to the death of at least 238 people. A preliminary report submitted by the Nepalese government indicates that 1,769 houses and 55 bridges were destroyed as a result of the floods and landslides caused by the rains. In addition to these issues, 37 roads were damaged, several of which connected Kathmandu with the rest of the country, resulting in the partial isolation of the city. Moreover, in addition to the disease, the Nepalese police reported that 29 people are still missing, while the government informed that search and rescue operations are still underway, with the participation of more than 30,000 troops. And the French National Assembly's Law Committee overwhelmingly rejected a motion for the impeachment of President Emmanuel Macron tabled by La France Insoumise, which criticizes the head of state for not respecting the results of the legislative actions. And gentlemen, 69 votes were cast and 69 votes were returned, giving a majority of 35 for 15 against 54. Thank you very much. And on Wednesday, the Japanese company Nintendo opened its own interactive museum dedicated to highlighting its history inside a restore factory in Kyoto, Japan's former capital. The installation exhibits different pieces that allow visitors to see the evolution of the company over 135 years of development, starting in 1889, with the infrastructure of Hanafuda playing cards, through toys and board games to reaching worldwide success with video games. Nintendo Museum has interactive rooms and adds to the fun, the various forms of smartphones now available along with other initiatives. The company has also announced the opening of similar facilities in Japan and other countries. And every October 2nd is celebrated as the International Day for Nonviolence, a date decreed by the UN and chosen to pay tribute to the figure of Mahatma Gandhi, leader of the Indian independence movement and pioneer the philosophy and strategy of nonviolence. The decree was approved on June 15, 2007, and since then, every October 2nd, the UN carries out cultural activities that promote the culture of peace, tolerance, and understanding among all citizens, citizens of the world. The United Nations resolution that establishes the day affirms that this date seeks the universal relevance of the principle of nonviolence. One of the most important reasons why the day is celebrated is because an estimated 1.6 million people lose their lives each year in an act of violence. We have come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website, telesurenglish.net. So join us on social media, Facebook, X, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok. For Telesur English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.